Okay, we've just learned about gene expression, the process of going from gene to protein. We learned that it's a two-step process. First step is transcription, rewriting the gene as messenger RNA. Second step is translation, translating the messenger RNA into the protein, which is really just a long chain of amino acids strung together in the right sequence to make a big molecule that does something very specific for the cell that's making it. Here, we're looking at a karyotype. So this is showing you the chromosomes that you would find in a typical cell in your body. There are 46 pairs. You can see chromosome pairs 1 through 22, and then the sex chromosomes, the X and the Y in this case. This individual is genetically male. You can tell that because they have a Y chromosome instead of two X's, which is the typical pattern for a genetic female. You'll notice that they come in pairs. You've got two copies of chromosome number one, two copies of chromosome number two, and so forth. We each get one copy from each parent. So one of your chromosome number ones you got from your father, one you got from your mother. Sometimes you can get too many or too few chromosomes. Uh, more or less than normal, I should say. So, for example, uh, Down syndrome is trisomy 21. That's where you've got three copies of the 21st chromosome. But most of the time, we've got two copies of each chromosome. They come in pairs. This is important to understand because it helps us understand some, some key aspects of genetics. I should also tell you that chromosomes 1 through 22 are known as autosomal to distinguish them from the sex chromosomes, the X and the Y. Those are the sex chromosomes. So the autosomal chromosomes are the same for both sexes. The sex chromosomes are different. So genes come in pairs because they're on chromosomes which come in pairs. So going back to this previous figure, chromosome number one has a few hundred genes on it. There are a few hundred different proteins that get produced when those genes get expressed. Not every cell is going to express each of those proteins, but it could. You have two copies of that chromosome number one, which means that you've got two copies of each of the genes on that chromosome. Not all of the genes are identical. So, for example, let's take the gene that produces the uh, potassium channel. We're going to learn all about sodium and potassium channels. These are special kind of um, valves, you might think of them, that sit in your cell membrane and let ions in and out of the cell membrane. They're slightly different flavors. Some, some people might have one flavor, some people might have another. Just like we all have different skin tones and heights and so forth as a result of slightly different variations of our genes. Same thing for the genes that produce aspects of your brain and therefore your behavior. An allele is one version or one flavor of a given gene. We say that an individual is homozygous for a particular gene when they have the same allele on both chromosomes. Homo means same. So if you've got the same flavor, sort of the same exact version of a gene on both of your chromosomes, then you're homozygous. If you've got two different versions, then you're said to be heterozygous. There can be anywhere from just a few to a couple of dozen different versions of any given gene floating around in the general population. Whenever you've got two different flavors, two different versions on your two different chromosomes for a given gene, then you're said to be heterozygous for that gene. Now we get into this idea of dominant and recessive alleles. A dominant allele is one where you see its effects regardless of whether you've got one copy of that allele or two. As long as you've got one copy, you're going to see its effects. If you have two copies, it doesn't matter. You're already seeing its effects. The second copy doesn't really do much, or doesn't do any more, let's say. Why would a gene be like this? Or why would an allele be like this? Let me give you an example that might illustrate. Uh, now, 
your your pigmentation, your coloring for your hair and your eyes and your skin and so forth, that's a pretty complex trait generally influenced by quite a few different genes. But there's one particular gene for hair color where there's a version of it that produces a really dark pigment in your hair follicle that ends up in the hair. The hair then has this really dark pigment. A pigment is just a chemical that absorbs certain wavelengths of light. So a dark pigment just absorbs most of the light that hits it and doesn't bounce much visible light off. If you've got that dark pigment in your hair, your hair is going to appear pretty dark because it's going to absorb almost all the light that hits it. Now, you might also have some lighter colored pigment in your hair. So for example, if you are a carrier for both that black hair gene, which produces the dark pigment, and for the brown hair gene, which produces a slightly lighter pigment that looks brown, you still look like you've got dark hair because that dark black pigment is absorbing all the light and making your hair look very dark. But if you take away that dark pigment, then the brown pigment is revealed. Your hair then bounces back more of the light that's hitting it, and it doesn't look quite as dark. So a lot of times, whether or not allele is dominant or recessive has to do with sort of the physics of what that gene does, what the protein is that that gene produces. In this case, the protein produces a really dark pigment in the hair. We say that a gene is recessive when you see its effects only if the organism is homozygous recessive for it, meaning that you've got two copies, the same allele on both chromosomes, that same recessive allele on both chromosomes. When that's the case, then you see its effects. If you only see the effects under that condition, then it's recessive. If the allele is such that you don't see its effects when you also have a different allele, then that allele is not recessive. It's, it's dominant. So another example would be having two alleles for non-brown eyes. We're going to talk more about eye color in just a minute, but this is often described as blue eyes, but green eyes fall in the same category. There's a particular gene we're going to talk about that influences the pigmentation in your iris, the colored part of your eye. If you've got two versions, if you're homozygous recessive for the non-brown version, then you will have non-brown eyes. The, the iris in your eye will, will not produce that brown pigment, and you'll get a lighter color. Let's talk a little bit more about eye color, because it's kind of a useful example, I think, and it's something that everybody can relate to. The primary gene that you've heard about that influences eye color is called the OCA2 gene. It's also called the BAY2 gene, B-E-Y2. And it's on chromosome 15. We've all got two copies of chromosome 15, which means that you've got two copies of the OCA2 gene, one on each chromosome. There are a few different alleles for this particular gene. The two most common ones are going to be the brown allele, which is dominant, and the non-brown allele, which is recessive. This particular gene produces a protein when it gets expressed that regulates the production of melanin. Melanin is a brown pigment that parts of your body, including your skin and hair follicles and your eyes, produce. And it produces kind of a brown pigment that absorbs most of the light that hits it and reflects relatively little. And what gets reflected looks kind of brown. There are actually other alleles for this particular gene one of which produces albinism. If you have another version of this gene, another allele, you would be an albino. You wouldn't produce any melanin anywhere in your body. It completely shuts down uh, the production of melanin. Now, this non-brown version of this gene, the recessive version, produces non-brown eyes, either blue or green, and we'll see why you can have that difference. Really, this is a relatively recent mutation. Uh, based on uh, looking at the distribution of this particular allele in modern day populations and comparing it with the known migrations of peoples uh, for the last few thousand years, 
our best guess is that this mutation arose somewhere between like 10 and 12,000 years ago, probably somewhere in Western Asia, Eastern Europe, right in that area, and then spread out from there. Now, thought question. The first person to have this mutation, did they have brown eyes or non-brown eyes? The answer is going to be brown eyes because the first person to have this mutation almost certainly would have only had it on one chromosome. The chances of them having the same mutation in both the genes on both chromosomes is very, very slim. So the first person to have this would have had brown eyes, but they would have been a carrier for this recessive allele. Okay, to really understand what I'm talking about, it helps to make a Punnett square, P-U-N-N-E-T-T. -T. So a Punnett square is generally two columns and two rows. The reason it's got two columns and two rows is because each column and row represents one gene or one chromosome. And again, everybody's, for the most part, has two. So in this case, let's make the top represent mom and the side represent dad. The, uh, the convention is to abbreviate dominant genes with a capital letter and recessive alleles or recessive genes with a lowercase letter. So in this case, we're going to have capital B for the dominant brown eye allele and lowercase b for the recessive non-brown allele. So here's mom. So what color eyes does mom have? She has brown eyes because the brown allele is dominant. If you've got at least one good copy, and really, the, in a way, the non-brown version is kind of a broken copy of this gene. It's a mutation. Fortunately, it's one that doesn't really cause too many problems. <laughs> I have blue eyes. Most people I know that have blue eyes don't have a lot of problems as a result of it. But it, it, it wasn't the norm 12,000 years ago. Okay. So this individual has brown eyes because they've got at least one copy of this gene to produce the, the protein that upregulates the production of melanin in the melanocytes in the iris. The iris is the colored parts of your eye. Melanocytes are little melanin-producing cells in there. This particular gene produces a protein that increases, that upregulates the production of melanin in those melanocytes. But this person is also a carrier of this mutated copy, this uh, non-brown version of this gene. And of course, if, let's say this is the first person to ever have this mutation, his or her partner will have this pattern. They're going to have two of the dominant copies, because that's all their parents had to give them. Now let's look and see what their offspring might have. So any kid is either going to get this copy from mom or this copy from mom, depending on which copy of chromosome 15 they get from mom. From dad, same deal. They're either going to get this copy or this copy. But in this case, they're the same, so it doesn't matter. So let's see what happens with the kids. All the kids get the dominant version from dad. Half the kids get the dominant version from mom. So they're just like everybody else. Half the kids also, though, get this recessive version from mom. So now half these kids are carriers, but they don't know it because they still have brown eyes because they've got that dominant pigment. In this case, it's dominant only because if you've got it, you produce brown eyes. So now, how do you end up with somebody with blue eyes? The answer is inbreeding. <laughs> it doesn't have to happen in the first generation, but at some point, a few generations down the line, you're going to get some uh, some descendants of this woman who have kids of their own. And here's how that would look. So at this point, you've got some descendants who are both heterozygous for this particular gene. You've got two individuals who are carriers of this recessive non-brown allele. But they also both have brown eyes because they're also carriers for the dominant brown-eyed allele. Let's see what happens with their kids.
So half the kids get this dominant allele from mom. Half the kids get the recessive allele from mom. Half the kids get the dominant allele from dad. And half the kids get the recessive allele from dad. So you can see three out of the four kids on average are going to have brown eyes. One is homozygous dominant, two are heterozygous, but they have this dominant gene. But one out of every four kids is going to have two copies of that recessive allele. They're going to be homozygous recessive, and they're going to have blue eyes. And this is going to be the first person on the planet with non-brown eyes, probably blue. I have no idea what the parents would have thought of the first blue-eyed kid on the planet. Uh, we can't go back and find out, but uh, apparently at least a few kids with blue eyes survived <laughs> and managed to have kids of their own uh, because now there are quite a few people with blue eyes. Okay, but that isn't the whole story with eye color. Oh, by the way, you should practice making those Punnett squares. It's really the only way to answer certain questions, like questions that will appear on the quizzes and on your exam. You'll have questions about what happens when you've got homozygous dominant parents and so on and so forth. When you see a question like that on a quiz, get out a piece of paper, draw your Punnett square, figure out what the answer is using that. It's the easiest way. So, this isn't the whole story about eye color. As you know, there are different sort of shades of brown. There's green, there's blue, there's hazel. It turns out there are actually at least three different genes that we know of that play a role in influencing your eye color, and there are probably more. Uh, the next most well understood one, though, is called the GEY gene. It's a totally separate gene on a separate chromosome. It's on chromosome 19. As far as we know, uh, it produces kind of a yellowish pigment. It results in the production of a yellowish pigment in your iris. If you have brown eyes, you would never know it because the brown pigment absorbs most of the light hitting the iris and none of that yellow light kind of bounces back because it's already being absorbed by the brown pigment in the melanocytes. But if you have non-brown eyes, then you're not producing those brown pigments and so you end up with either green or blue eyes, depending on which version, which allele of this GEY gene you have. The green version, we think, produces kind of a yellowish pigment, which when combined with the kind of natural default bluish color of the eye, which really just has to do with the physics of how light bounces around in your iris. When you add yellowish pigment to that, it produces eyes that look kind of green. And it's dominant because if you're producing the pigment, then you get the green eyes. If you don't have that pigment, then you have the, the kind of default blue eyes. What about hazel? So there are complicating factors like the density of melanocytes, those melanin-producing cells in the iris. There are other genes and alleles that increase or decrease the production of pigments in your eye. So you could imagine somebody who, uh, instead of producing no brown pigment at all, no melanin, they just produce relatively little. They would have lighter colored brownish eyes where some of the green or blue comes through. You might call their eyes hazel. So what do you think? Is eye color genetically determined? You might be tempted to say yes, but remember, for every trait we've looked at, there's both a genetic and environmental contribution. And this is actually no exception, although the environmental factors that can influence this tend to be pretty extreme. But you could imagine a child being malnourished or undernourished, and as a result not producing enough pigment in their iris, or maybe there's a delayed response. You probably know that uh, children of European, Western European ancestry, many of them, are born with light colored eyes and then gradually over the first year or so uh, their eyes turn brown. This is a result of a gradual buildup, a gradual production of melanin in those melanocytes in the iris of the eye. There are other factors. You could potentially have a virus that 
uh, infects the eye during prenatal development and essentially breaks one of these genes. That would be kind of an extreme case of an environmental variable influencing eye color. I'd like to also briefly talk about sex-linked genes. These are ones that are on the sex chromosomes. Though generally, when we're talking about sex-linked genes, we're talking about ones that are on the X chromosome. You need an X chromosome to live. You don't need a Y chromosome, which is good because females don't have one, and yet they survive just fine. There's nothing crucial for life on the Y chromosome. But there are some really crucial things on the X chromosome that can cause problems if they're broken. You may know that red-green color deficiency, often described as color blindness, is much more common in men than it is in women. That's because it's a sex-linked gene. It turns out there are two different photopigment genes. These help you perceive certain wavelengths of light out in the environment. We'll learn all about this when we get to the vision chapter. Men are much more likely to have mutations in these genes because they've only got one copy. So if they have a mutation in that one copy on their 1X chromosome, then they're out of luck. Women, on the other hand, have two X chromosomes. So they have a backup copy for every X chromosome in every cell in their body, including the photoreceptors in their retina that transduce light into changes in the electrical potentials of those receptors, as we'll see later. I also want to distinguish sex-linked genes, which are ones that are on the X chromosome, or the Y, from sex-limited genes. The vast majority of the differences between the sexes are as a result of autosomal genes, ones that are on chromosomes 1 through 22, which are exactly the same for men and women. But these genes are expressed only or mainly in one sex, usually as a result of differences in hormone levels. Hormones, as we'll see later, can influence gene expression. So even though men and women have the same genes, they can get expressed very differently depending on the uh, circulating levels of sex hormones.